Hollywood Star Playhouse joins the ABC Network. In just a few moments, we will present a thrilling dramatic story called I'm a Coward, starring Barbara Stanwyck. First, a word about another link in the great entertainment chain ABC puts out every Thursday night. Tonight is also the night for the original Amateur Hour with Ted Mack. That's the show which has been making entertainment history for years. The program which has discovered some of the top names in show business today. Tonight and every Thursday night, you hear the stars of tomorrow. The singers, dancers, and musicians whose names will blaze in the bright lights of the future. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC tonight for the original Amateur Hour with Ted Mack on ABC. Now, Miss Barbara Stanwyck on the Hollywood Star Playhouse. <laughs> Hollywood Star Playhouse, tales of suspense, thrills, adventure by Hollywood's finest writers with Hollywood's top stars, brought to you each week by the American Broadcasting Company. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Orville Anderson. Welcome to the Hollywood Star Playhouse. Have you ever complained that your life was dull, prosaic? Have you ever harbored the secret hope that something, anything might happen just to relieve the uneventful tenor of your existence? Come along then on the shocking misadventure of Doris Wilson as portrayed by Miss Barbara Stanwyck in the story called I'm a Coward. <laughs> many times before their death. That's always been my favorite quotation from Shakespeare, but I never really appreciated it until tonight. You'll never know how many times I've died tonight. Has it all really happened tonight? In the space of a few short hours? It seems so many lifetimes ago since I reported for duty in the newspaper room of the main library. There have been so many long, long afternoons and evenings there, but somehow when the tall man with the impersonal stare approached my desk, I had a feeling that this time would be different. Miss Wilson? Yes, I'm Doris Wilson. Detective Sergeant Harley from Homicide. Oh. The reason I know your name, I was here this morning talking to the others. About what? Catching a murderer. Catching a murderer? Really, Mr. Um, Sergeant Harley... I know it sounds crazy, but murder's a crazy game. And this fellow used to be a newspaper man, which means that he's got a nose for news, especially about himself. I'm afraid I'm not following you. Okay, let me give it to you. One, two, three. One, the man we're looking for is Harry Carlin, the Omaha Ripper. Oh, I, I remember reading about him. Two, we have reason to believe he's in this part of the country, possibly right here in town. Three, one of these days, he's likely to come into this library and ask for the bound file of the Omaha paper of the month May. It was May when it happened? Yeah. The way I figured, he may just possibly get to feeling safe enough and curious enough to want to see how the hometown papers wrote him up. Like I said, it's a crazy game murder. And you want us to be on the lookout for him? Especially you, Miss Wilson. Me? Yes. Because you're on the evening shift. Something about fugitives seems to make them think they've got less chance of being caught at night. Uh, here's a circular on him, front and side view. Hmm. But he's almost sure not to look like this now. I mean, instead of dark hair, it could be light. And Well, what I mean is the rest of his features are hardly distinctive enough. You're way to... ahead of me, Miss Wilson. Look, here's something that's been underlined. It has to do with the index finger of his right hand. You see, the tip of that finger is missing down at the first joint. Oh, so if a man asks for the Omaha papers for May, and the tip of his right index finger is missing, oh, I'd probably be so scared I'd faint. Not if you concentrate real hard on the $10,000. 10000 For information leading to the arrest and conviction of Harry Carlin. But, Sergeant... Yes? Supposing this man should come in here, what, what, what would I do then? Call headquarters, ask for homicide. If I wasn't in, you'd tell the desk man, and by the time Carlin had finished reading about himself in the back files of the Omaha paper, 
There'd be more policemen here than have ever been in a library before. Any more $10,000 questions? After the sergeant left, I couldn't help feeling a bit foolish. Imagine me, Doris Wilson, who was afraid to walk the two blocks from the streetcar to her home each night. Imagine me catching a murderer. But I read the circular over and over again. At least it would be good for a laugh when I met Ted at the cafeteria. You're late. Only a few minutes. Had to tell the girl who released me about the stranger... Oh, Ted, don't tell me that's all you're going to have for dinner. I'm not hungry, Doris. But, Ted... Finish unloading your train and sit down. Something's come up. Tell me now. Doris, uh, remember I told you I might be transferred to a slightly better job in Houston? Oh. When do you leave? 1215 plane. Tonight. Tonight? I, I had no idea it could happen so fast. They, they broke the news to me at 4.30 and I, I grabbed the phone to call you. But then I thought... It'll be better this way. I, I... I don't know what to say, Ted. You know what I want you to say. That you'll take that plane with me. Houston's as good a place as any to get married. You know I can't do that to Mother. Do what to Mother? Whose idea was it to sink all your savings in that poor family flat? It was hers, wasn't it? Well, now let her pay it off without the benefit of your paycheck. You know how hard that would be for her. As hard as it will be for you. Or maybe you can marry some guy who'll let you go on working for the next 12 years. Or better still, maybe he'll be rich enough to present her with a paid-up mortgage. Ted, you're not being fair to Mother. She isn't too well. She's getting along in years, and she needs security. Look, let's not go through all that again. Doris, maybe I'm not being altogether fair to your mother, but I'm more concerned about your being fair to yourself and to me. Doris, you do love me. You know I do. Then why can't you come to Houston with me? We'll manage to send her some money from time to time. That wouldn't be enough. Oh, what's the use? Lots of things I got to do before I catch that plane, Doris. Goodbye. Ted. Yes? Maybe something will happen yet. Like what? Well, I... Oh, no, I... I guess it is crazy. Goodbye, Ted. was just crazy enough now to believe that it could happen. Harry Collin, the Omaha Ripper. He could come into the newspaper room at the library and I could collect the $10,000 reward. It would solve everything. I hurried back to work and got out the back file of the Omaha paper for May. And I didn't even shudder as I read the full account of how Collin had come to be called the Ripper. It was almost nine o'clock, almost closing time. The newspaper room was nearly deserted, and I was telling myself that it it might happen tomorrow or some night next week, next month, just so it did happen. And then a man who had been sitting there most of the evening reading the current issues came up to the desk. I wonder if there's still time for me to get a back file. You have 20 minutes, if that's enough. Plenty. Uh, The Omaha paper, please, for May. If you'll fill out a slip. Oh, Didn't know you made people sign for him. You're left-handed. What's so unusual about that? Well, uh, I'm left-handed too, Mr. Uh, Rodman. I'll get you the file right away. Gray hair and tinted glasses that didn't even let you see the color of his eyes. And there was a mole on the end of his nose, the most genuine-looking mole. No, oh no, he couldn't be Harry Collin, and yet, if only I could see his right hand. Oh, why was I such a coward about tricking him into showing it to me? Wasn't I in the public library? Weren't there people around? And wasn't Ted leaving tonight? Leaving without me? On the 1215 plane to Houston? I thought he gave me a funny look as I came out of the back room where we kept the brown files. And that right hand of his, he... He kept holding it so I couldn't see his index finger. Had trouble finding it, huh? Well, uh, somebody had put it in the wrong rack, but here you are. Oh, I'm so sorry. You make a practice of dropping them on the floor? It, uh, slipped out of my hand. Here, I'll I'll pick it up. Never mind. No harm done, I guess. It didn't work. Is that what he meant when he said no harm done? 
Did he know that I had deliberately dropped the bound file, thinking that he would grab for it instinctively and I'd get a look at the index finger of his right hand? Now what was I to do? There he sat at a nearby table, turning the pages with his left hand, always his left hand. And it was already ten minutes to nine. Homicide, please. What's that? Can't hear you. Speak louder, please. Connect me with homicide. Homicide? One moment, please. He went on reading this Mr. Rodman, who might be Harry Collin, the Omaha Ripper. Went on reading as though unaware of me or the fact I was making a phone call. And unaware of the fact that the other two men in the room had just put down their newspapers and left. Homicide, Sergeant Harley. This is Doris Wilson. Louder, please. Seem to have a bad connection. The library. Doris Wilson. Yes, Miss Wilson. A man, Carlin. Is he there? I, I I can't be sure. You see... One moment, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Rodman? Oh, don't let me stop you. No, no, that's perfectly all right. Lady, you look awfully pale. I feel all right. Yeah? Well, what comes next? Next? I've had enough of these papers. Do I... Check them back in. No, no, you can uh, just leave them there. Should have known. Now you can go back to your conversation. Miss Wilson, did he leave? Yes, it's too late now. Not if you follow him. Quick, before you lose it. But if he's the man you want and he sees me... Don't let him see him. There should have been an officer around somewhere. Well, go on, go on. <laughs> As I ran down the front steps of the library, I couldn't see him, and I was glad. It was all very well for the sergeant sitting at the other end of the phone to tell me, go on, go on. I'd been scared to death from the moment this fantastic thing had started. If it hadn't been for the thought of that $10,000 reward, but but now my chance of collecting that reward was gone, and that meant that Ted... And then I wasn't scared anymore. If it was humanly possible, I was going to find that man. All the time he'd been a few feet away, waiting with several others to get on the streetcar. And no policeman in sight. I couldn't get on the same streetcar. He'd be sure to recognize me. Well, maybe none of her took off my glasses, and the streetcar was crowded. And besides, I had my hat on now. All right, step back, folks. Step back. Plenty of room in the rear of the car. Come on, step back. That's better. At every stop, I looked around frantically for a policeman, but there wasn't any. And all the while, more and more people were getting off, making it more and more likely that he'd notice me, recognize me. I, I took a seat down front and pretended to be looking out of the window. And one time, just as the streetcar had started up again, I caught sight of him walking away. Conductor, conductor, let me off. Sorry, miss. You have to wait till the next stop but now. I've got to get off. It's terribly important. Ma'am, I'd lose my job to let you off before I reach the next safety zone. Anyhow, we're almost but there. But I'll lose him. What am I doing, you know? Hard and fast company rule. All right, here we are. Now, watch your step, miss. As fast as my high heels could carry me, I ran back to the street where I'd seen him turn off. It was a dark street with few houses and many trees. Trees that locked their branches to keep out the light of the moon. And there was no one above. No one. I had lost him. Looking for someone? What? Oh. You were looking for me, weren't you? Looking for you? I knew it all the time. That's why I let you here. You've, uh, you've mistaken me for someone else. No. No. Neither one of us is mistaken about the other. You're the foolish young lady from the library. And I'm Harry Carlin. The Ripper. We'll continue with Act Two of I'm a Coward in just a few minutes. Though there are more graduate nurses in service than ever before, constantly increasing needs for nursing personnel, including the growing requirements of the armed forces, have created a demand for still more. 
The opportunity for a professional education and the chance of working with leaders in their community in serving humanity awaits thousands of alert girls who choose nursing as their career. If you are a young lady seeking a future with meaning, go to your nearest hospital for information about the career of a graduate nurse. Now, Act Two of I'm a Coward, starring Miss Barbara Stanwyck. My eyes were closed and I was afraid to open them. I said to myself, you're Doris Wilson and you work in the newspaper room at the library and you've had a frightful dream. But if you weren't such a coward, you'd realize that there isn't any maniacal killer named Harry Collin, the Omaha Ripper, and that you didn't follow him to try to win that reward of $10,000 and that he didn't trick you and trap you. But even as I was telling myself all this, something was trying to impinge itself on my consciousness. A sound, a voice. Yes, that was it, a voice. Maybe it was Mother come to tell me it was time to wake up. No, this was a man's voice. And it kept coming in stronger and stronger. If I listened, I might even be able to make it out. out of the main library a few minutes before 9 o'clock this evening. Colin may be using her as a hostage, in which case extreme caution is advised. Repeat, extreme caution My eyes were open now. I found myself in a dimly lit cabin with blinds tightly drawn. He was standing right above the cot on which I lay. And he held a long, sharp, gleaming knife. You fainted. Did I? Makes things inconvenient. Better not do it again. I won't. You're just saying that to humor me. You think just because I'm different, I can't figure things out, but you're wrong. Look how I figured things out when you followed me from the library. I promise you, I won't faint again. If you do, I'll have to use this knife. You wouldn't like that, would you? No, no, I wouldn't like that. All right. Now, what do you think I'm going to do? I have no idea. I'm going... I'm going on a trip. You are? A long trip. The last trip in the world they'd expect me to take with you back to Omaha. What? You heard what they said over that police broadcast. As long as I've got you with me, they're going to exercise extreme caution. I'm sure they will. But that's not what you're thinking. You're thinking that if I try to take you with me, they'll spot you. Yeah. I could see the lights go on in your eyes. But you're wrong again, Miss Doris Wilson. They'll never recognize you. You're... You're very clever. Well, you'll believe that before this is over. They haven't recognized me, have they? If I hadn't made that one mistake of walking right up to you and asking for the back files of the Omaha paper for May, would any of this have happened? No. I've learned plenty about disguise. Plenty. You certainly have. Go on, humor me. But you'll see. In a little while, I'll be back. And you'll see. He bound and gagged me, and then took my hat and one of my shoes and went away. The moment the door snapped shut behind him, I started frantically to try to get free. But the slightest effort was excruciating pain, and nothing happened. I kept telling myself that something would, something must... No knot had ever been able to hold Houdini for more than a few seconds, so it was possible. It was. A dozen times I almost fainted from the sheer torture, but I wouldn't let myself. Not even when I felt my hands grow wet. If there was anything I couldn't stand, it was blood, but I stood it now. And then suddenly my wrists were free. My fingers were so numb that I fumbled for an eternity with the rope around my ankles. If only I had a knife. His knife. How long was it now since he had gone? How long before he'd be back? Oh, I was getting it now. I was get. Then I heard him. What could I do but spring at him? Want me to use my knife? Oh! Again, it was a voice that brought me back to consciousness. The same voice. I was propped up in a chair now with someone combing my hair. And then the combing stopped. 
I opened my eyes and saw that Carlin had turned to face the radio. Missing girl, Doris Wilson, is reported to have gotten off streetcar there. Canvas entire district within radius of six blocks. No man must be permitted to leave this area, particularly if accompanied by a woman, without due investigation. Complete data now available on clothes worn by Wilson girl when last seen. List follows. Exciting, isn't it? Yes. Sometimes... When I feel as sure of myself as I do now, I, I, I get such a thrill out of it. Just think. Me, Harry Carlin, that wasn't considered good enough to hold a newspaper job. Me, that might have lived and died without rating more than a couple of lines on a copy. A copy on a back page. <sighs> well, they, they've already got extras out on the street. Y you should have bought one. I know why you're saying that. To keep me talking. You want those police cars to get here before... Uh, you aren't fooling me. Come on, get these things on. Hat and coat. And shoes. Low-heeled shoes. It'll make you look a lot shorter. And guaranteed to be a perfect fit. The hat and coat, too. Go on, go on, put them on. They're new. Brand new. The woman's shop down on the boulevard that I've had my eye on for a long time, just in case something like this happens. Oh, come on, come on, you're wasting time. Stand up and put on this coat. There's... A mirror, so as you can put on your hat. Oh, so, so that's why you were combing my hair. Pretty expert job of turning your hair gray, huh? And in that hat and coat, I dare him to recognize you. Come on, come on, before I lose my temper and use my knife. Outside, he had a car. The street was wrapped in empty shadows as we drove away. Where were the squad cars? Surely they had had time to get here by now. But as we turned onto the avenue, there still was none in sight. A few more blocks and we'd be outside the searching area. And my wild, frantic hopes would be blown away like so many flimsy straws. Remember the knife. I'm like lightning, but it's see like lightning. I'll, I'll remember. Your driver's license, please. What did I do, officer? I stopped at that boulevard sign. You can't say I was speeding. No, no, nothing like that. Your driver's license, please. Say, I, I bet you're looking for this killer from Omaha. Uh, well, what's his name? Uh, Carlin. Carlin. I heard it on a news broadcast. Then you can appreciate the pressure we're under. Have to work fast. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Last thing in the world I want to do is to get in your way. My driver's license. Hmm. Let's see now. Oh, here it is. Thank you. Everything okay? Guess so, Mr. Winters. That's right. Albert Winters. And this is my wife. Here you are. Uh, there's just one more thing. You probably know about the finger. Yes. What's that, ma'am? She said yes. We know about the finger. Carlin's index finger on the right hand. The tip of it's missing. Why? I'll have to ask you to take your gloves off, sir, so I can look at your right index finger. Why? Of course. Hurry, please. Mm. Having trouble with this glove. Officer! What, were you going to say something, dear? I guess you changed her mind, officer. Anyway, look. Index finger of my right hand. Sorry for all the trouble. Oh, not at all. Uh, ma'am, don't look so scared. That kill will never get by us. Now one chance in a million. Well, good luck, officer. They had me out. Well, they would have if he'd asked me to bend my finger. But just holding it out and in the dark... You're a devil. Now you're beginning to appreciate me. But watch yourself. I came awfully close to letting you have it back there. The next time, I will. If only I hadn't been such a coward. If only I'd cried out when that officer was standing beside the car. But it was that knife, that long, sharp, gleaming knife he held that had cost me my chance. My one desperate chance for freedom. And he drove on to his safety. And my blood and brain congealed into an icy hopelessness. Somewhere we stopped and left the car and then got into a cab, but nothing really registered. Not until... Well, so you finally snapped out of it. We're, 
At the airport. Too bad you didn't come out of your trance before. The way I took you right past those cops that had posted all the entrances. The way we walked right up to the window. I looked up then and I saw Ted coming toward me. Doris? Ted, who should have recognized me if anyone would, but... Sometimes. He walked right by. I can't even believe it myself. The way... Watch it. What? You look like you were going to faint. Oh, no. All I can say is, better not. I sat there and told myself how lucky it was that Ted hadn't recognized me. And after all, why should he? For all Ted knew, I'd gone back to the library and then home to the four-family flat. He'd been so busy getting ready to leave town, he wouldn't even bother to tune in his radio or buy a paper. And the last thing he'd expect was for me to be at the airport, disguised and at the mercy of a madman. All right, come on. Our plane's here at gate nine. What? Come on, I said. This is our plane. All right, watch it now. Have your tickets ready, please. Have your tickets out. Voice of the gate yeah, it sounded it. vaguely familiar. I looked up. Tickets, please. Detective Sergeant Holly of Homicide. Have your tickets ready. And beside him, wearing an attendant's uniform, was Ted. Tickets, please. Here you are. Thanks. Okay, Carla. <laughs> run, Doris, run! Look out, that night! Doris. Doris, are you all right? I... Don't think, Doris. It's all over with. Thanks to the sergeant dragging me along to watch every bus and train and plane that left for Omaha. But you... I just couldn't go to Houston and leave you. So I, I went to your house to tell you. And... Oh, darling, when I think what might have happened to you... Doris, d- don't faint. But of course I did faint. You see, I'm such a coward. Barbara, a show is always a great one when you do it. Know something, Orville? I really like doing this one. Thanks, Barbara. We feel particularly honored in having not only you, with such a great performance as well on this first show of our new series. Look, uh, while we're throwing bouquets all over the place, just let me say thanks to Harry Bartell, Ken Peters, Herbert Litton, Tony Michaels, and Shepard Menken. You're nice folks to work with. Thanks again, Barbara. Barbara Stanwyck can soon be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, Man with the Cloak. Tonight's play was written especially for Miss Stanwyck by Maurice Zim, with music by Basil Adlam. The entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. And now here's the star of next week's thrilling story on Hollywood Star Playhouse, Mr. McDonald Carey. Oh, yes, Paula. Every contract has a cancellation clause in it. Even the one you and I made, to love, honor, and cherish each other. But do you know how long, Paula... How long our contract is good for? Until midnight. Only a few minutes more. Until death do us part. Until death do us part. Sounds like a honey for next week. Thanks, Mac. We're all looking forward to it. On tonight's program, all characters and incidents were fictitious. Any similarity to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, this is Orville Anderson saying good night for Hollywood Star Playhouse. This is Barbara Stanwyck again, reminding you to stay tuned to your ABC station for that entertaining program, The Original Amateur Hour. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company.